All righty. So, uh, Betsy, would you remind us what 819 is all about? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, and I'm actually going to turn it over to my colleague, Michelle Childs, but who is here from Lunch Council. But big picture, um, H819 is in regard to municipal authority to regulate uh, marijuana odors via ordinance. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me in. For, Mich for the record, Michelle Child's Office of Legislative Council. And um, Betsy Ann and I are going to kind of co staff this and maybe be in and out because I draft all the drug laws and I worked on all the marijuana laws, but she's your expert, obviously, in government operations and municipal authority. So um, we're going to tag team on this. Um, so just as she mentioned, the, the bill is introduced is, is fairly straightforward. It's amending actually a, uh, a section, uh, so Title 18 is where you have your, uh, your drug laws, so where you have all of your marijuana laws. It's in the health chapter under regulated drugs. And so you recall first thing out of the gate this year was the, uh, the action on H511, which became Act 86. And just for a little recap, what it did is it uh, allows anyone who's 21 years or older, as of July 1st of this year, to be able to possess an ounce or less of marijuana. Um, they can also cultivate up to two mature plants and four immature plants uh, in their dwelling. Um, dwelling is uh, kind of the just, there's a definition of it in 511 and maybe, um, it might be helpful maybe to, if Denise might take a link from Act 86 and put that under H819 as well. That might be helpful for you guys. Oh, that's great. Oh, fabulous. Thank you. Right there. That's great. So you guys can go back and forth because you're, you know, you might be wanting to kind of consult the underlying as you're talking about the policy for H819. And um, so uh, there is a, the, the individual limit for what somebody can cultivate is uh, also the per dwelling unit. So if you have um, you know, multiple adults living in, in a home or an apartment, um, you, they would still be restricted. That per dwelling unit would be the two mature and the four immature. Um, there are restrictions on where you can consume marijuana. and. I'll show you that because that's going to be, um, I think, directly related to what you're talking about in H819. So, uh, there is a provision in 819, you'll see up here <coughs> at the top of the page. And this goes into effect on, on July 1st, along with the rest of, of uh, Act 86, is that a person shall not consume marijuana in a public place. Public place is defined extremely broadly. So um, uh, there are, <coughs> for, as we start to see the law play out, people will start to feel, figure out where is not included. But for the most part, it's going to be mostly people's home, private homes and their, their property. Um, but uh, public place would be any public accommodation. Um, it'd be street, sidewalk, lawn in the state house, out, out in the general public. Um, and so I uh, just want to let you know there, and that's a, it's a civil penalty, so it's a ticketable offense. Um, and in that law, you'll see, and here's, and the way that it's structured, I don't you guys maybe experienced this before, where you have in one session, um, two bills that amend the same section of law. Have you ever done that where one goes really fast and then you want to amend the same section of law and so we do a July 2nd effective date so that one doesn't cancel out the other. And so that's the way that H819 is structured is so the language that you see um, in section one um, mm. uh, would take effect on July 2nd right after the other one does just so you understand how they're kind of piggybacked. And so in, a, uh, in uh, Act 86 is this existing language right here, which you see, which is that um, the section uh, that is allowing people to possess and to consume um, with restriction um, doesn't prohibit a municipality from adopting a civil ordinance to provide additional penalties for consumption of marijuana. So if there was, so there's the general ability to be able to ticket, you know, something that goes to judicial bureau, but municipal, municipalities have the authority to be able to do their own with regard to public consumption. And this is just adding the additional authority for municipality to define um, 
as a public nuisance any significant odor that emanates from a person's property due to marijuana consumption on property. Questions for Michelle Thanks, and then Warren. Do we uh, define significant odor anywhere? No. It'd be pretty hard to do it. Just curious. Warren and then Rob. Well, the earlier language prohibits use in, in, in virtually anywhere outdoors within the municipality. The street and alley, a park, and, you know. Right. I mean, it's just, I, just about the entire town outdoors. Yes, although, you know, in your, I mean, imagine what, you know, was going to come up and, and what the decision points for the municipality is going to be is that if people are, so, you know, I live in Montpelier, right? So it's a pretty densely populated, my, you know, I can wave to my neighbors yeah. from my back porch or whatever. So if somebody is, they're not, they're on their own private property, I'm not sitting on my back porch or I'm sitting out on my back, you know, my yard there. If I, so maybe I should use me, but if, if someone was consuming marijuana in their own backyard, you know, that is, um, I might be able to be visible to my neighbors. I might be able to be visible from the sidewalk, somebody, you know, looking into my backyard, but I'm, I'm not in a public place according to the definition under Act 86. Yeah. And so I think the issue is really going to be one of when somebody is uh, consuming under Act, you know, in, in accordance with Act 86 on their private property, but maybe the marijuana smoke wafts over and can be smelled by their neighbors. Um, is that something that towns want to adopt something and identify as a public nuisance? And if they do, that then seems to come very close to a, a total ban. Because if anybody smells it coming from a private dwelling or the yard, uh, a municipality could deem that to be a significant odor. Uh, oh, they smelled it. It's got to be significant. Boom. Now you can't even smoke it in your house, or maybe you'd have to have a close your windows. Close your windows. Uh, I mean, it, it, this this then just comes so close to potentially being a total ban that I wonder why we would have passed the earlier law allowing it. That would be a question for the sponsors. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and also, there might be some help answering your question, Warren, in the um, the document that Tom Little sent to us mm -hmm. from the commission, mm -hmm. the governor's commission on marijuana. Uh, we've got Rob and then Jim. A uh, couple questions around this. Uh, going back to the, the cultivation, mm -hmm. it's it's my understanding you have four mature plants, two mature plants, correct? Too mature for immature. Correct. Mm -hmm. But you can have an unlimited amount of the finished <coughs> dry product. Right. So the way that it is is that um, there are requirements about how it has to be cultivated. But any marijuana that you cultivate from those mature plants, you're allowed to keep as long as it is stored on the property. It, as long as it is stored on the property where the marijuana is cultivated and reasonable precautions are, are, are taken to kind of secure it to make sure that people who wouldn't be, shouldn't be accessing it like under 21s. Um, so that does not count towards the ounce. But the, the H-19 only deals with the consumption aspect. So it's mostly it's just going to be about uh, smoking. You know, right. there are like out west where you have very, very large cultivation, you know, operations there, you know, um, I think there have been some towns that have been looking at um, regulating the odors coming from those large cultivation spaces, but the, the amounts per dwelling unit are, are fairly small. And this doesn't, the 819 only deals with the consumption piece, not with any odors coming from growing a couple plants. Well, is there any language in here that pertains to multifamily units, apartment buildings? No, but the, the way that, uh, well, in, in, in Act 86, dwelling unit is defined, it, it's, if you have a multi-family, it's each dwelling unit. So if you have a, a triplex, it's each one ha can have the individual allotment. And can they smoke in their individual units? If it, as long as it's not prohibited by the lease. Okay. Yeah. Jim? 
So along the same line, so nothing in current law would prohibit an apartment from, apartment complex from having uh, more restrictive than the state law? Oh no, there's nothing that affects you know the the lease agreement with regard to landlords and whatever their the lessees are doing. So okay. um, uh, you know, I imagine what you're gonna see probably with a lot of places where people are renting property is um, landlords are gonna say put in the lease that you can't do that because they may have issues around. Well, I don't want to jeopardize my insurance, my homeowner's insurance by you know because you have to have written permission from. Uh, your landlord, if you're gonna, if you're going to be con, um, uh, cultivating in that space, and so. Um, but how about using the product? Not for using. No. Nope. But if you're going to be cultivating, you have to have permission. Okay, but if you're using the product, can the landlord prevent that? Yeah, they can do that now. Just about, like they can say, we don't want you smoking cigarettes in, in your apartment. We don't want the, you smoking the, the marijuana in your apartment. sponsors brought up the issue of maybe condo associations uh, or townhome associations where you're in close quarters. Could they, could the association prevent um, use of marijuana within that complex? I, I don't know anything about condo associations and the specific rules that regulate those, but um, I don't see why it would necessarily be any different from um, like an, anybody who owns property that is contract, you know, that has an agreement with either the homeowners or the, the tenants. Um, there's nothing in Act 86 that says that you can't make that you can't regulate that by contract by lease. Okay. Okay. Um, what? One other, but maybe more for Warren, so I can. I, I, I have a, a response to Warren's question. Okay. Um, in terms of why would we pass a law and then allow a municipality to? I mean, I guess I would liken it back to uh, liquor. Um, we've had prohibition and you know, whatever 80 years ago, but we still allow for dry towns. Um, I mean, again, it's the town that would have to, and it, in this particular case, I guess it would only be those towns that are in close quarters. It certainly wouldn't apply to Chittenden because we're just too spread out. Uh, yeah. So. We've got a lot, quite a lineup, Michelle. Sure. I hope you were in intending to mm -hmm. stay with us for a while. I, I can, and then also I just want to let you know is I do have um, Sarah Anderson right over here. Sarah is one of our, she's a third year law student who's working <coughs> with us too, and so you may see her sometimes when we have to pop out and you know, Great, pushing you. towards Friday. Thank you very much. Yeah. But welcome. Um, we've got Marsha, Jessica, and John, and then I would hope we could have Betsy come and do her part of this so that we can start on the folks who have come in from outside to talk with us about this bill. So, uh, Marsha? So, who am I asking the question to? Oh, where'd she go? There she went. Uh, Michelle, Marsha oh. wants to ask you a question. Okay, please. Um, how would this work as far as hotels, uh, because under liquor law, um, your room that you have rented for the night basically counts as your residence for that evening. Um, how does that work? Act 86 does not permit consumption in any public accommodations, which would include, which would be all hotels. Which would include yeah. hotels, mm -hmm. okay, so it would not be considered your personal you residence. You are not allowed to okay. consume in a hotel. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's my question. So I have a question. Um, Michelle, thank you. <laughs> Jessica and John both want to pose the question to you. There. So uh, I'm just curious about a noise. Would this be similar to a noise ordinance? So <coughs> you know, to go back a little bit to what Jim was asking. But first you can answer that if you want. Then I, have um, I would have Betsy Ann address that with regard okay. to the municipal authority pieces. Okay. Okay. Money. No, no, that's okay. I was just trying to figure out if you lived in a condo and you'd say you, you own your townhouse and they own their townhouse and there's a wall between maybe right. that you share because right. those townhouses are connected. And so now, as far under a noise ordinance, if there's a big party next door and it's 3 a.m., you can call the police and say, hey, the noise, you know, we have a noise ordinance and blah, blah, blah. I just wondered if it would be the same rule because of this 
as far as um, odor from marijuana, would they be so able to? So you're talking to, about specifically around condo association? Well, it's more, about being able to more enforce that. It doesn't have to be condo, because it could be, like you gave the um, uh, example of the neighborhood. So you're mm -hmm. in your home, and you live pretty close, because you're in Montpelier, and the house is, like you said, you can go see out on the porch. And so it could be on your porch as well. Right. I think maybe I would kick that to Betsy and to talk a little bit more about how okay. nuisance ordinances okay. are typically enforced in municipalities. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. The shells are drunk. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and John? Well, I guess my question is a municipal question, so save I'll, it for Betsy. I'll save it for Betsy. Okay. Thank you very much. Michelle, thank you. Okay, Betsy. So you've got your first couple of questions. Your first question is right here. Right here. After you finish telling us whatever you want, okay, you need okay. to tell us. Let me just pull up um, the general municipal authority, regulatory authority. Uh, this is the go-to statute uh, for municipal regulatory authority. It's 24 VSA 2291. It provides a long list of the issues that municipalities can regulate. Let me just pull it up very quickly because. Uh, Currently, you'll see once I pull up this statute. 14. That's right. Representative Gann, you are ahead of me. <laughs> um, subdivision 14 already allows, I will show you the intro language, that for the purpose of promoting the public health, safety, welfare, and convenience, a town, city, or an incorporated village shall have the following powers. So these are things that they're authorized to do. You go down to subdivision 14, it's a very broad, to define what constitutes a public nuisance and to provide procedures to take action for its abatement or removal as the public health, safety, or welfare may require. This is broad nuisance authority to define what constitutes a nuisance and then to provide procedures to abate those nuisances. And towns treat nuisances in different ways. It could possibly be noise as a nuisance or maybe certain trash. And actually, I think I, I'm not very familiar with the nitty gritty of each town and what they do for Nord Ordinance Authority. Maybe VLCT would be a good resource for the boots on the ground um, implementation of this nuisance um, execution of this law that allows nuisance authority. However, so that's broad nuisance authority. You would think, oh, well, so don't municipalities have this authority already to regulate uh, this marijuana odor? And so I should say, as a legislative attorney, I can tell you what the law says and what case law says. I cannot provide legal advice or guidance to towns. Um, and I'm not um, in the executive or judicial branches that would actually try to um, prosecute or defend laws or in the judicial branch that would um, adjudicate any challenges. But let me just give you a run through of municipal authority. Now you've seen the document that I'm about to pull up before, our Dillon's Rule handout. <laughs> you remember, we're a Dillon's Rule state, which essentially means that the state controls municipalities. And through our case law, and this is case law um, that is um, applied throughout the states that are Dillon's Rule State, Dillon's Rule being for John Forrest Dillon. He was an Iowa Supreme Court justice, and he became an expert on municipal powers. Um, but you can see down in this portion two of municipal authority case law, these are our Vermont Supreme Court cases, or some of them, on municipal authority. If you look down to the second bullet, it says, we have adopted Dillon's Rule, declaring that a municipality has only those powers and functions specifically authorized by the legislature. And such additional functions as may be incident, subordinate, or necessary to the exercise thereof. So a municipality has to be granted specific authority or to have authority that derives from um, the specific authority that was given to a municipality. And as Michelle was reviewing for you the provisions <laughs> of Act 86, um, there's a few things that stick out that Michelle already reviewed, but I'll go back to them um, for you. For example, on page five of the Act, there is the language regarding the ability of people to possess certain amounts of marijuana. And 
of these amounts that, that they are permitted, the language goes on to say that um, here, is, here are the amounts of marijuana that may be possessed. <clears throat> and a person who possesses those amounts shall not, be, shall not be penalized or sanctioned in any manner by the state or any of its political subdivisions or denied any right or privilege <clears throat> under state law. So people throughout the state are allowed to possess these amounts of marijuana. Then at the top of page six, it goes on to say that a person shall not consume marijuana in a public place, just saying in these public places as that term is defined, marijuana cannot be consumed there. So if it's not a public place, consumption would be allowed. And then, the bottom of page seven, it goes on to say, but this section does not prohibit a municipality from adopting a civil ordinance to provide additional penalties for consumption of marijuana in a public place, that public place definition. So it appears to me, based on our Dillon's Rule case law, that municipal authority right now under Act 86 is limited to ordinances to provide um, penalties for consumption of marijuana in a public place. So, because that's the current law, limited authority of municipalities to regulate the consumption of marijuana, it does seem that a municipality, if you did want to allow a municipality to regulate odors emanating from one's private place where they live, for example, you would need to give a municipality that specific authority. And that's what H819 is desi designed to do, to amend Act 80, that Act 86 language to say, OK, the section does not prohibit a municipality from adopting a civil ordinance to provide additional penalties for consumption of marijuana in a public place, or to define as a public nuisance any significant odor that emanates from a person's property due to marijuana <coughs> consumption on the property. So this is a policy decision for you to make if you want to give municipalities this authority to so regulate marijuana odors that emanate from a person's property. Does that make sense? Uh, John, did you want to ask your question? Uh, no, uh, that's the already answered it. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I thought, I thought you would ask your question. Okay. So, and, but I just, I'm still not sure that I understand. So, Right now, do, they, do municipalities have the um, ability to regulate noise? Is that the same sort of ordinance as this would be? I believe that they are. Yes, I believe it seems like they're along the same vein. Okay. Um, it likely is um, if towns regulate noise, it's likely through n nuisance authority, I would think. Um, I haven't taken a survey of towns to see what kind of nuisance ordinances they have adopted. Maybe that's where our BLCT might be a resource to discuss um, those types of ordinances to address nuisance and like noise. Okay. But it seems to be along the same thing. Like you know, you, you, versus, you know, loud noise, <laughs> police officer comes, can you turn it down? Yes. Um, okay. Seems like the same idea. Uh, Gwen, you'd like to weigh in? Uh, Gwen Zaka, VLCT, I can shed maybe a little bit of light on this. So if you uh, look at McQuellen Municipal Corporation's treatises, which basically talks about <laughs> municipal authority, um, when you're looking at the definition of nuisances, well, there's no one core definition. It's not really possible to define it. Um, I'll just read from what it says. It may be generally stated that a nuisance is a thing, condition, or use of some um, continuity as distinguished from a solitary act, which through offensive odors, noises, substances, smoke, ashes, and soot, dust, gas, fumes, etc., works, hurts, annoyances, inconveniences, or damages to the public or to another with respect to his or her comfort, health, repose, or safety. Um, and then going back to what, um, what was just said about the Dillon's Rule application here, you still have to link that back to some specific language to give the authority um, for those things. So. Great. Thank you. Okay. So uh, before I ask a question, I was going to make a little statement here. Uh, uh, these odors are, uh, are certainly going to cause an awful lot of work for uh, state and local police. Because as people are smelling odors, especially if they don't 
really want to be exposed to it uh, or don't want people even use it, they're certainly going to be calling in uh, local police often. And uh, when they smell the odor, when they smell the odor and they see somebody get in their car to drive, they are certainly going to be calling the police to let them know that these people, are, I smell the odor and now they're driving. I think it's going to be quite a burden on the local police. I think, you know, I think the whole lot is, uh, is, is a burden on an awful lot of municipalities. So uh, my question is, uh, we have town health officers. And I just wonder, uh, are they going to have some special training? Are they going to get involved with this? Or are they going to, when they get the calls, are they going to pass it on to the local police or state police? I'm not sure if it affects those local officers. Anybody can answer, answer that at this point. Any other questions for Betsy? Okay. Then, committee, are we good with starting to hear from some of our guests who are here to help flesh out information in this regard? No? Okay. <coughs> Betsy, thank you. Now, yeah. I shall, I shall, do you? Do you get a well, 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 yes. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to run out. I can start it. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> Did you know I nominated Representative um, Devereaux to be director of committee IT? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. I'm the one that needs help. Betsy, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Heads up, heads down there. But is, do I remember correctly that you're needing to zip in and out this no, morning? No, I'm good this morning. It's good this yes. morning. Okay, great. Thank you very Thank you. much. All right, if we could, please, I'd like to ask um, Chief Page, if you wouldn't mind. It's, it's my understanding that um, you raised this issue with your local reps? I, I did, yes. Yeah. Oh, please, take a seat. Bill. Okay. Um, my name is Timothy Page. I'm the Chief of Police for St. John's Bear. Um, I think uh, the most concerning part for us as far as the police department are going to be uh, uh, multiple unit um, rentals, uh, dwellings that uh, where the, the smoke is going to emanate from one to another. Um, we're not looking to be uh, so restrictive that we're denying the use. That's not what. That's not what it's about. It's about we are going to get those types of complaints, uh, and they are going to be numerous. And especially until I think uh, landlords can put in their lease that they they allow it or they don't allow it. Um, and I think that those will get hashed out over time. I you know, people will begin to know that this unit allows it and this one doesn't, and they'll, they'll move to those. Uh, residences accordingly, but until that happens, there's going to be a mixture of people in those residences, and, and those types of complaints are going to come in where we're, uh, uh, the people are affected by the smoke um, and uh, want us to do something about it. So in order for us to do that, we'd have to have a local ordinance, um, and that's that's another thing that would uh, we'd need some time to talk about because uh, as I said, we don't want it to be so overly restrictive that it, it denies the, the person uh, their right of use. But we do need it to be uh, decide what type of restriction we're talking about um, and uh, exactly what type of units it's going to affect. So um, it's something that's going to need to be hashed out uh, over time here. Thank you. Uh, questions for the chief from the committee? Well, and then uh, along with your line here, Chief, is, um, I, I have several rental properties, and, and I have to say that this is causing a little, a little distress here. In that <coughs> the, the scenario that you're paying is a very realistic one. In fact, it probably happens a little bit even today. <laughs> and I could see where 
I mean, would it be fair to say that you talked with the, the tenants a couple of times, but then all of a sudden it's like, hey, Mr. or Ms. Landlord, um, we, we got a situation here that we keep showing up on your property fairly frequently. What are you going to do about it? That, that's very real possibility um, because if it becomes overwhelming, uh, that is who we're going to go see because it, it's uh, we can't be there numerous time after time after time. You know, our resources are limited and uh, they can't be focused on that one area. So we would be looking uh, to the property owner to uh, be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, other questions for the chief? That's right, Lauren. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate what you said about uh, not wanting to be so restricted that it brings my fear into play. Mm -hmm. But there are other municipalities and other departments that may not be as generous as St. John's Bury is. Uh, so it seems to me you you will have the burden of defining significant in this in this proposed statute. What what is a significant odor that emanates and I, and I think that that's what I that's what I'm talking about when I say that's something that needs to be discussed and determined over time. Um, so yeah, it's going to need to um, it'll include our representatives and the VLCT, and we'll have to sit down and we'll have to hash out what we're going to define as significant. Uh, so we're not overly restrictive, but yet we're looking to the needs of the other tenants <coughs> who are being. Uh, Offended by the by the owner, so it's it and it and it is going to happen. It's not a question of maybe well, it will. We know that it will, and uh, it, and I, I'm not so much concerned with the um, backyard use and it wafts into somebody else's backyard. And if that's a problem, I, I, I think that can be defined in this too. But it, that's not going to be as burdensome as uh, the multi-family units and stuff. So, okay. well, thank you. And Rob has a follow-up. Uh, there seems to be a little connection here between noise and, and odor. When you have a noise complaint, do you have sort of a threshold that you start from and go from there as far as how you respond and deal with the situation? Noise complaints deal mainly with the time frame because that's usually people sleep, and so that's easier an easier thing to enforce because between this time and this time you can't have a, a noise that you know disturbs other people basically. So it, it's pretty that's pretty straightforward. Right. Where this is doesn't have a set time frame. It's going to be it's going to be uh, what someone deems they're they're being offended by basically. So you know, and we'll have to have like uh, like I was just saying to uh, Skitzmill that. We'll have to have some type of standard that will that will have to apply because we can't just uh, one officer's offensiveness is you know not another officer. So we have to have a standard that we'll be able to use in that regard. And uh, what that is, I can't tell you. That's what we'd have to show. Thank you. So let, let me ask Lauren and then Jeff. Should we infer from what you're saying in regard to needing the, uh, to hash out the real meaning of significant over time with the LCT and your local state reps? Um, are, are, is it your suggestion that that discussion happen before this bill is moved, if it's moved? Or can this, in your view, be moved without that uh, definition having been worked out. I think I think we obviously have to have something in place. So I think the bill can move forward without that significance determined. Um, I think we have to have faith in our legislators and on uh, the governing bodies of our municipalities that they're going to make good decisions. You know, it's. Uh, um, but it is, it is something that's, that is desperately going to be needed because, uh, like uh, we've said, it, we are going to be going to these, and without anything in place to address it, it's just going to uh, snowball. And uh, eventually it, it, it morphs into other violations because we have people fighting over it. So uh, we'd like to nip it in the bud before it, before it happens. Um, and like I said, we're not looking to be overly restrictive. So I, I really believe it could move forward and give us that position before before this happens with the uh, 
caveat that they, it is going to be thought about in, uh, at length before we do anything. Thank you, Dennis. So this may not be for you as much, but uh, marijuana consumption, uh, eating it or whatever, or something, uh, doesn't emit any odor. So I just wondered if maybe it needs to be uh, due to marijuana <coughs> smoking, burning, something that causes odor. Because all it says is marijuana consumption. I, I just wonder if we need to be a little bit more clear. You're not going to get an odor unless something's burning. From, well, from what I recall, I can tell you that marijuana has a, a wicked odor when it's growing. And, and you can smell it very easily. We're supposed to only have two plants. That, that, that won't matter. One or two, you'll smell it. So. Well, to follow up on uh, Representative Devereaux's earlier Dennis. questions, Dennis. Let's say that it's a Saturday afternoon and somebody's on their back patio and they're imbibing recreationally. And then they hop in a vehicle and drive off. And you get the phone call that, you know, Representative Devereaux is, you know, now on the road and I know for a fact he was <laughs> imbibing. <laughs> Does that give you probable cause to? get behind him and stuff, have an interaction with him, her, Ben? I would say your conversation with the complainant is what's going to determine that. If you've got a complainant that's willing to testify in regards to what they saw um, and then what they, wit they witnessed operation of the vehicle, then yes, you do. Or smelled, but not saw. But no, you'd, smelled. Have to, you'd, have to, you'd have to see that actual person consuming uh, the marijuana and, and then drive away. So if you had those things in place, then yes, you, you'd be able to do that. And, uh, but if, if you have a person that says, well, I don't want to get involved, I'm not going to do anything. So that, it, it makes it very iffy. So uh, it, it could happen. So if, so if I was the complainant and I just said, listen, I, I know that he was there, I can smell it, but I didn't see him, then that probably would be a determining factor for how you would proceed or not proceed. Right. I mean, we, it, I can always observe operation. Sure. And if there's any untoward operation, uh, that in, in and of itself would be an indicator. But uh, just going that I smelled marijuana and then this person drove away. That's, and that's going to probably happen a lot and we're not going to be able to observe operation of every car that's leaving everywhere. So it, it is. Just to check a follow up on that. Is, isn't, doesn't that, does that happen now with alcohol? I mean, people would happens say, all I the saw time. them in yeah. a bar and they were drinking. Yeah, it happens yeah, all so the time. How do you um, differentiate it, that? It, it's the same as what I just said. It's if that person is willing to come forward and say, yeah, it, with alcohol, it would be different because you have a limit. Mm -hmm. So, um, with marijuana, you can't consume and drive. With mm -hmm. with alcohol, you can consume so much and drive. So, uh, with that, you know, somebody says, "I just saw so and so drinking, and he left the bar." I mean, that's what you do at a bar. So that, that's really not much. But again, we'd observe operation if we could, and if there was any op operation that signified that the person might be under the influence, then then yes, we can do something, but it's all, it all depends on uh, what we see and what we're told. So. Oh, any other questions for the chief? <coughs> oh, thank you very much. Thank you. I very much appreciate it. So I want to ask our two St. John's very reps, would you, either of you, like to uh, give any testimony or are you here just to listen? I just, I don't, myself, Scott, back for the record, I don't, I don't have anything to add to what the chief had to say. No, and it, uh, you know, because I was here when you all had the run around, yeah. but uh, I may just add, because again, I'm, I'm so thankful that the that chief was here. I think we already had a discussion. We, we'd also have heard from, from members of our select board, and they have delegated that to our 
to our town manager. But unfortunately, in lieu of next week being his busy week with uh, with town uh, with town hall meeting week, he's on vacation in Hawaii. So that's why he couldn't have him here today. You could have got him on the phone. I, I told him that, but for some reason he was like, no, I really want to just enjoy my vacation. They don't have phones in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> but no, but but again, I appreciate you all continuing to take this time and and and. Certainly, our our municipality was 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 very interested um, to at least have have this enabling language, so that way, if obviously they so chose, they would have the ability to to look at new uh, nuisance ordinances relating to this older. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. You, so what? Uh, yes, you do not need to stay unless you want to stay, but you're welcome to stay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, how about we hear? Let's take care of. Um, both perspectives at once. If we could call up, Denise, could we have that phone number for Trevor Whipple? Um, and he's coming, he, this is his cell number, and he's going to be walking out of his uh, staff meeting. And folks, so that uh, if we could, after we talk with Trevor, what I'd like to do is get Tom Little on the phone. So if you could pull up on your devices what he sent to us. Mm -hmm. Tom Little sent us an extensive piece of writing from, uh, in his role as um, co-chair of the Governor's Commission. Yes. You think I should just go down at 9.30 or a little before or wait? It's 9.30 your hour. Use your best judgment, please. Well, oh, this is riveting. You're, you're, you're oh, yeah. an old Wait man. means more important. They're retirement. That's key. <laughs> <clears throat> I got a five-day-old donut right there. So, like, folks, you're like pulling up Tom Little's stuff, right? So you're yep. ready for his call after Trevor. Is it under his name or did Yes, it's under his yes. name. And how long ago? It was an email yesterday. 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 It's, it's on our web page. Hi, it is, Trevor. Uh, Trevor, <laughs> hi. It's Tomato Townsend calling from House Government Operations. Good morning. Good morning. C can you spend a few moments with us right now on the phone? I can, yeah. I'm getting to a, a quiet space and we should be good. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, as you're walking, I wanted to tell you, we just heard from the uh, police chief in St. Johnsbury, and it was he who raised uh, this issue with his uh, state reps, asking <laughs> if they would um, help move something along to... to uh, to provide a basis for the a community if they wanted to, to establish an ordinance about the, the odors, should there be such. Right, okay. okay. So from your perspective, what would you, so we, we've heard from St. Johnsbury, um, which is a community configured in certain ways and of a certain size. Um, your perspective dealing with um, a, a much larger population, Sure. Um, yeah, and, and certainly thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak with you. And I'm sorry I can't be there. I think I, I lose. I lose quite a bit by not hearing others, and I don't want to be repetitious of what uh, Chief Page had to offer. But um, you know, I, I'm, I'm I'm not sure that uh, this is an issue that we'll face often. But the struggle is, if we do face the issue, if we don't have a mechanism to deal with it, it's going to be incredibly difficult for some of our citizens. Um, a particular concern to me is uh, we have so much, um, lack of a better term, congregate housing or you know joint housing facilities where we have some large apartment structures, condo structures um, that I equate this a little bit to um, like our, our public nuisance ordinance that regulates uh, noise. Um, if you live in a close quarters building with lots of other people in their apartments or their condominiums, and your neighbor likes to listen to his music at level seven at uh, midnight because uh, that's when he happens to be awake. Uh, we have a mechanism now to try to help uh, mediate or, or mitigate that through through local ordinance. Um, some of the concerns I have is that you know as we move forward and prepare for legalization of marijuana, um, there's a lot that we don't know and we're not going to know until we actually go there. But 
um, you know, I have concerns about uh, particularly these these uh, joint housing facilities that if I'm a non-smoker and maybe have a, a young baby in my house and the person that directly abuts my uh, domicile is a person who believes in the use of marijuana, they're growing some marijuana, they're using it regularly, they have their friends over, um, and now the smoke starts to either through the hallway, through a joint heating ventilation system, you know, if that starts to enter my domicile, uh, and and the you know the landlord has not um, put any restrictions on my lease, uh, what am I to do? And if somebody calls the police and says, you know, I'm I'm trying to live a, a drug-free, smoke-free life, and my neighbors uh, think differently than me, and now I can't be in my home. Uh, the police have no mechanism to deal with that other than tell them to turn to their landlord, which is, uh, you know, one means of redress, but it's not expeditious and it's not going to help us today. Thank, thank you, Trevor. Um, can, yes. Are you all set for, for a question or two? Oh, sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think that, uh, you know, my understanding, I've read it in a bit, but the legislation deals quite well with a lot of the public areas. You know, you can't smoke in a park, can't smoke uh, in cars, you know, that type of thing. But yes, I'd be happy to, to hear from folks. Thank you, Trevor. Uh, Cindy Weed from Enosburg. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> How do you handle cigarette smoke going into a home with a new baby? Um, again, uh, you know, that's the, at this point, um, we have not had a lot of those calls, and uh, we, would, we would turn the person to, to their landlord. Um, I differentiate only a little bit um, in that certainly there's health impacts to, to cigarette smokes, but I don't think that there's some of the, the mind altering, uh, the, the body mechanism altering. Uh, I think it's at a different level than marijuana smoke in, in my mind. Thank you. Uh, Rob? Uh, Rob LeClaire from Berrytown. Good morning, Chief. Good morning. Um, uh, we, we had a conversation about, you know, say if you had gotten a phone call from someone uh, reporting a, a gathering on an afternoon and, you know, people were smoking marijuana and then got in their vehicles and drove off as to how you would react to that, actually from the Chief in St. Johnsbury. A question I have around that is there's, there's a constant analogy between marijuana and, and alcohol consumption, but isn't some of it the intent? In other words, you can go in a bar, have a beer, and your intent isn't to get under the influence, but isn't it always the intent that when you're smoking marijuana that you're going to be, your intent is to get under some level of um, being under the influence to some degree? I mean, I I have not done a lot of surveying of regular marijuana users, but you know that's my understanding is that you know we smoke marijuana because it alters how we feel. Um, you know there there are some that that will indicate that smoking of marijuana has medicinal properties. We see it. Uh, we, we've had medical marijuana for a number of years now, but certainly uh, my understanding of marijuana and. I've, I've never used it, not in college, not in high school, so I don't have the personal experience, but talking to folks that have is that it does, uh, it does have an impact upon your body, upon your thinking. Thank you. Other questions for Chief Whipple? Uh, John Gannon from Wilmington. So sort of following up on Rob's question about medical marijuana, I mean, uh, wouldn't this, you know, a, a public nuisance ordinance with respect to the odor marijuana pr potentially prohibit people who are using marijuana for medical purposes from using it, which would, would cause me some concern. I mean, there is evidence that medical marijuana um, does have tremendous benefits for some, for some people. And, and I would sure. hate to see them being denied the right to, to, to make themselves healthy. Well, I mean, what, what I see this ability to craft an ordinance is for um, for a nuisance. We we have had, and, and I testified on medical, medical marijuana when it was passed, and I was in Barry at the time, so that's that's more than 11 years ago. Uh, we've had no calls. There, nobody has ever called about medical marijuana. Um, and, and I see it differently because I see a medical marijuana user as somebody that's using um, on their own. They, they don't, we don't have a, a congregation of 12 medical marijuana who say, users who say, come over to my house Friday night after work. We're going to get together and use our medical marijuana. Uh, medical marijuana users, uh, at least I see, 
more restraint, you know, less impact on those around them. Uh, what I'm looking at is someone who, uh, you know, we have the Super Bowl party, and I invite 10 or 12 of my friends over, and we're, we're sharing some beer, and we're, we're gathering together. But if suddenly everybody decides that they want to smoke marijuana, and we have an overabundance so that there, there really is, uh, you know, the potential to impact neighbors, uh, I, I don't see it as uh, having any impact on medical marijuana. Hasn't, as of today, we've had no complaints, and I don't see that changing. But, but we have had people ask questions about condos and, uh, you know, apartment areas where, you know, somebody could be smoking pure, purely for medical purposes and, you know, the odor <coughs> drifts down the hallway or, or, you know, into another apartment through the air ducts. I mean, how would we address that? I mean, I'd be concerned about denying the people the right to use mar medical marijuana. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I still think, uh, I feel, as a non-marijuana user, that I should not have somebody else's use impact my life. Um, you know, I think that uh, that medical marijuana user, as they do today, um, I, I believe, just out of a, a, a nuisance category, uh, should be doing it in such a way that it does not uh, have a negative impact on neighbors. Now, whether, I don't want to get down a rabbit hole, but whether there's a clause uh, inserted that says there's some special protection for a medical marijuana user, I, I, I don't have a recommendation on how to do that. Um, I guess the only thing I can reflect upon is that we have medical marijuana now, um, and this isn't an issue. Um, Jessica, Jessica Brumstead from Shelburne, and then Rob LeClaire from Berrytown again. Okay. So, All right. Thank you. Um, so this is more part of the discussion with Representative Gannon, but I, um, I mean, the other issue here that I thought of earlier, and I'm not sure where I'm at on all this, but just to bring up, is that smoking cigarettes, we have gotten to the point where culturally nobody wants anybody smoking in their house, so everybody goes outside on the doorstep, including my own brother, you know, we kick him out. Mm -hmm. But if yeah. we now start saying that um, not only can we, we're going to kick you out because you're smoking marijuana, you're smoking it, I'm talking about the actual smoke, then, um, then we say on the outside we're going to also call you on it because you're, use, you know, you're outside affecting people. It is sort of, this is hard. This is probably why I voted against. <laughs> um, but this is a hard um, issue because honestly, well, just think about, any... just Sorry, think about someone that's smoking a cigar. And I know that when I lived in an apartment in Burlington, there, our neighbor was a cigar smoker. And it was terrible because he would do that every morning before work. So we're getting dressed to go to school smelling his cigar outside. So. This is hard. That's all. That's the only reason I'm. Let's not get carried away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if I could, I are a little different. Committee, <laughs> committee. If I could, I think Trevor was trying to respond. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off, Representative. My apology. Yeah, I mean that's that's an unattended consequence here, and and I'm a, you know my, my testimony, my take on marijuana is no secret. I'm well documented, and you know that's a, that's an unintended consequence here is that now that we're going to allow this to happen in our society, um, it has an impact. And I'm sorry, I'm a very staunch anti-marijuana person. I will respect the law. We will enforce the law. But why are my rights as someone who does not want to be exposed to marijuana smoke? Uh, why shouldn't that be? Why shouldn't that be equal to someone who wants to be exposed to marijuana smoke? Uh, you know, if I'm paying to live in a in a building and that's my domicile, uh, I I can't just go to a hotel because my neighbor decides they want to smoke marijuana. And yes, I know it's difficult. It's going to be legal for someone to smoke marijuana, but you know that. They can go somewhere. They can move somewhere. You know, they can go somewhere else to smoke to uh, to a different place. And you know, I'm not saying we should. Uh, you folks in legislature have determined that it will be legal for this to happen. I respect that. Um, and I think it, you know, we just need to try to find a balance. To what about the po the folks that don't want to be exposed to that, and they're in the safety and the comfort of their home? How do we how do we regulate that? I mean, I guess. I push back a little bit to to you folks and say, you know, what do I as a police chief tell someone in my community who has invested in their life savings in a condominium 
who now finds out that their next door neighbor is growing marijuana, regularly smoking marijuana, and they have to smell and breathe and live it every day. Um, I, I don't have an answer to that, and uh, it, it's going to it's, it, it's potentially going to be difficult. Uh, Trevor, we now have Rob from Barrytown, followed by John from Wilmington, and then uh, back to Cindy from Enosburg. Rob? Wow, I should, I should make sure to come and testify in person from now on. <laughs> okay. Never, there's this many questions. Actually, <laughs> sorry, Chief, sorry, Chief, this one isn't for you. This is to just um, your question about the medical marijuana, John. I had a tenant that, that had the medical marijuana card, but they disclosed it to me up front, and we had the discussion about how they were going to deal with it. And we agreed that you weren't that they weren't going to smoke it, that they were going to put oh, it okay. in and deal with it the other ways. And there's what they call it a tincture, tincture, They were going to use that. Yeah. And the other thing about the tobacco, I as a landlord, I do have to address that issue. I've had tenants call me and say, hey, "Listen, the people downstairs are smoking, and I have my mm -hmm. young child here, and I don't want it, <laughs> and I have to deal with it." Mm -hmm. As so, a landlord. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Um, so this just right. makes it even more difficult. Mm -hmm. One more thing, yeah. Uh, John from Wilmington. So, so I, I mean, uh, the thing I'm struggling with is this whole o idea of a concept of odor nuisance. Because, you know, I live in a fairly rural area. We have a lot of farms. You know, people spread manure. My wife loves the smell. I'm not oh. so sure about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, what if what if that's next? What if we say you know spreading marijuana is an odor nuisance, and we basically take a huge chunk of our economy and throw it away? You meant, spreading you marijuana. Meant manure. No, spreading manure. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> I apologize for my. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Trevor's got an answer for you. I I can, I can give you the Trevor Whipple response. I can't give you the police chief response, and I'm not a scientist. And I've got zero medical background, but. I grew up working on a dairy farm, and, and manure didn't alter my mind. Manure didn't impact my lungs that I'm aware of. I think it made me grow tall and strong. But uh, you know, the smoke from marijuana, uh, we know that there's dangers to secondhand smoke. Um, and you know, I, I think we have an even escalated concern with marijuana because there are, you know, we're talking about medicinal properties. There are mind-altering, body-altering uh, components in marijuana, and you know, if it's deep smoke, you know, coming directly through my air vent, uh, I, I believe that's going to have a very dim, different impact on me than I than if I smell the, the the fragrant smell of a Vermont farm. Cindy from Eatsburg. Yeah, thank you, Chief. Uh, there's been testimony that 80,000 people already are using marijuana in the state. So, have you got any calls calls in South Burlington about that yet? Um, I mean, we get we get calls about the people who are you know smoking in their car, smoking, uh, seen smoking uh, at the park. But you know, as far as someone in their home, and, and uh, you know, one one of the representatives there asked about medical marijuana. We've had medical marijuana. We have a facility here that grows the marijuana, and we've had no calls about that. Um, so it has not been uh, uh, it has not been an issue for us. You know, one of my concerns and my my hesitancy here is, as it becomes legal, <clears throat> how much will use change, you know, and how much will accepted group use. Uh, and I don't necessarily worry about, you know, a, a person after work uh, sitting down at home and lighting up some marijuana to, to enjoy as the law will now allow them to do any more than I do as someone cracking open a beer after work. Um, you know, more concerning to me is large gatherings in a communal building and not being able to provide any relief to anyone. Thank you. So, uh, Trevor, I made it here. I just want to make sure we have a clear understanding if there is clarity to be understood. <laughs> as, as it relates to the, uh, the bill before us, 819, that's its number, isn't it? 819? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, are, would you, are you able to encourage us to move forward, or do you think we should put this back on the wall, or otherwise amend? I, I did not print the bill this morning. My memory of the bill is that it's to allow municipalities to craft ordinance, correct? Yes. 
So that being the case, I, I would be I would ask the committee to support the bill and give some uh, ability to a community to craft an ordinance if they saw necessary um, to assist folks in their community who may be negatively impacted by the use of marijuana by others. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, committee, anything else for Trevor or should we let him get back to his staff? Back to your staff. Thank Trevor. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Th thank you, folks. You've got a tough so job, much. and I know there's uh, a lot of different ways to look at this, but I appreciate your time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. All right. So, could everybody's already pulled up Tom's piece? You there? Of course, I've got it. Um, in the email. No. It, yeah, it was. It was in the email. It's also. And it's on, also on the page. Okay. Under Tom's name, yeah. um, on our web page, it's the last one on the list for today. And we asked, um, he, where's the, where's the, um, attached on our page is the, um, his attachment isn't there. There was an attachment. What? To his letter. I it's thought there were. Oh, wait a minute. No, 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 no. I take it back. I it was take it back. It, it wasn't That's, in the first email. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's, it's yeah. here. Yep. This That's is the good. attachment. Thank you. I was getting confused, obviously. Okay, so let's try and get Tom on the phone while we're dialing him up. Refresh your minds. Rescan what he wrote. And. That's underlined, that he um. underlined to call our attention yep. to. And Tom's the co-chair of the uh, Governor's Commission on Marijuana, among other things. Hi, it's Maida Townsend calling from House Government Operations. Good morning. Good morning. Um, is now an okay time? Yes, perfect. Great, thank you so much. And we have pulled up on our respective devices here in, in committee the, um, the, the, uh, the piece that you wrote and sent to us by way of an uh, attachment right. to your email. So we have that in front of us. Um, would you just, would you like to uh, verbalize, um, you know, put, put the, the verbal clothing on the, on I'd be the, the be happy to. I, I guess I'd start um, out by uh, me mentioning the, the report that the, the uh, commission issued in the middle of January. That was a pretty wild time when 511 was getting ready to go to the floor. And I'm not sure that a, a lot of people had an opportunity to read in a, in a reflective way what the commission uh, report had in it um, under those circumstances. But I think it's a pretty good resource. It covers a lot of issues that uh, reflect the concerns of local government. It doesn't provide a lot of uh, you know, concrete proposals, but uh, some of them are just placeholders and hopefully will be further addressed when the commission uh, issues its final report this coming December, uh, which is the plan. Okay. Um, and I think the focus of the, the, the single uh, biggest focus of the December 2018 report is likely to be uh, discussion of and proposals concerning a whether the state should move to a fully regulated and licensed retail sales model. Um, but in, in any legalization model, including what we have now that'll be effective this coming July, you have um, issues involving local government and 
Um, one of the specific uh, pieces in the January uh, 2018 report was a uh, recommendation that towns be given authority to regulate nu excuse me nuisances. The report uh, covers or mentions both odor nuisances from cannabis use and odor nuisances caused by cannabis cultivation. I, my understanding of H819 is that it's focusing exclusively on the authority of a town or city to uh, enact an ordinance uh, treating uh, consumption-based odor as a nuisance. That, I, is, I, that is the language in the bill is introduced. Yes. Right. And I, um, I've had some brief uh, email exchanges with uh, one of the sponsors of the bill, uh, Representative Will Hoyt, uh, just to get a sense of you know, where he was coming from on this, but I haven't had a chance to engage in, in, a, in a more detailed discussion about it. But, um, and I don't know what, what the, com the committee's background is in the law of nuisance or nuisances, but um, I, I also don't, um, and, and, that, and that's something that the committee could get, I'm sure get some support on from legislative council. And we have heard from uh, Betsy Rask with regard to yeah. uh, municipalities and their authorities in, in this regard. So I, 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 I um, it, 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 so I don't know whether whether Betsy's testimony or that of others would be that a uh, clarifying bill like this uh, is fine as is in terms of its um, the, de the level of detail to which it gets with concerning a clarifying carve out for for towns and cities to enact nuisance ordinances here but this seems like it's certainly not inconsistent with h511 uh, which i don't think pur purports to restrict uh, local nuisance uh, regulations um, and it's certainly consistent with the report that we issued in the middle of january so i guess i'll i don't want to I don't want to read the memo back back to the committee, and I guess I'll, I'll stop there for, for now. Thank you, Tom. And thank you for trusting that we have actually read your memo, <laughs> which we have. So, so thank you. Uh, questions from the committee for Tom? Uh, here's Rob LeClaire from Berrytown, Tom. Good morning, Tom. Good morning. And this may be more of a question for Ledger Council than you, potentially, <laughs> but... Um, do you have an opinion, say if you have a, uh, I don't even know if I want to call it a municipality, but you have a, a small town that doesn't have any ordinances and has this issue and uh, Vermont State Police are the one that end up responding. Uh, do they have anything that they can point to to address the issue in statute? Well, if, if that's, that gets somewhat back into the weeds of what of the different types of, of, of uh, nuisance laws. Um, there are um, uh, under the, the common law the, uh, of civil nuisances, um, the courts will hear a claim by a private citizen, a resident of a town, against another resident or business claiming that the activity on the other person or business's property um, is so is so regularly and and uh, in, impactfully hurting their enjoyment of their own property that that's amounts to a private nuisance that the the civil courts should should respond to and ultimately you know, if the plaintiff in that kind of a case. Uh, prevails, the judge can order an abatement of that activity or some type of uh, remediation of it. Um, that gets you into all sorts of other related areas of 
local and state permitting. Um, sometimes you, you read about cases where uh, a, a, someone is trying to reopen an old quarry or do some, some uh, rock crushing. And um, there's, there's, there's often, in those cases, there's a lot of potential negative impacts in terms of noise, uh, dust, um, and other stuff, and blasting. And, the, and so um, sometimes a, a property owner in those situations will go to court asking a judge to say, this is a nuisance, uh, stop it. That's not the kind of thing a, a, a state police officer would get would want to get involved in. Um, if the activity on that property was somehow, uh, and I'm, I'm sort of just thinking out, out loud here, it was somehow um, vi so uh, pervasive and intense that it could sort of credibly be alleged to be violating some state uh, standard or statute, uh, the state, the uh, state police might get involved, but they, I think they would be more likely, if, if called, to refer that to the um, Department of Environmental Conservation or some some department in the Agency of Natural Resources that might have a direct regulatory oversight over that kind of activity. Um, in terms of, of odor emanating from somebody's house or yard uh, from uh, consuming cannabis, um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know in a, in, in a small town scenario, um, I mean, my guess is that if, if there was a credible complaint that law enforcement might at least do a uh, stop by the property to see if there's anything else going on. So I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. Um, was I've lost track. Was there somebody else in line? No. Uh, committee, anyone else want to ask Tom a question? No. Cindy yeah. from Enosburg. Hi, Tom. <clears throat> you have some underlined uh, language and the second part of it that's not underlined you talk about in communities with limited or no lo local law enforcement other mun municipal officials should have sufficient resources to assume the responsibility of enforcing local ordinances and I could you explain that I'm not sure what you're really saying there well um, I think it, it's, it ties in a little bit to the, 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 the my response to the previous question. Um, if um, in a small town with no um, local law enforcement, it would maybe a contract with the county sheriff or the state police for some level of coverage for highway safety, for example. Um, and um, there are uh, spillover effects, or, or the, the claim is that there are spillover effects from marijuana consumption or marijuana um, a grow operation. Um, this is suggesting that um, there should be at least consideration given to providing some regional or statewide resources for towns like that to help so those are react to that. Excuse me. Those are the other municipal officials should have sufficient resources. That's what you. Yeah, mean I mean, I think I think that's the we, the, the commission didn't um, take detailed testimony on this. I think um, we did uh, the, the 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 subcommittee that uh, helped develop this particular set of recommendations had. Uh, on it, members of uh, local government and a representative from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. And I think this is just reflective of an overall level of concern or anxiety about the unknown and, and what, um, how um, inadequate local resources can be. Thank you. Okay. 
Anyone else for Tom? Uh, Tom, just for clarification purposes, in, in your attachment, the language which is in italics, is it uh, the, the words in italics? Those words are taken from the January report, yes? Yeah, yes, verbatim. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to double check that. Contrasted with the words which are not in italics, those are your words in writing to us, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Jessica Brumstead. So, just has a, a question. Hi, Tom. Just as a follow up to that. So, the commission's hope, I would assume then, because I did go back and look this up, but it seemed to me you were saying it would be great if legislators thought about these sort of issues. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. That, uh, you know, the, one, one of the things to keep in mind um, at, the, at the high level is that um, the, the, the two states that, that we sort of know the most about, although even there the, the, the uh, legalization um, has only been in effect for less than 10 years, uh, are Washington and Colorado, both of which are states where county government is much more robust than it is in Vermont. And um, the, uh, that, that's not always easy to translate into practical advice or uh, specific steps in, in, the, in the legislative context, but when you I think it's just helpful to, it's healthy to be aware of, of that, that um, if, you, if you visit states like that and you start talking to people in state government or in the legislature and get into a discussion about how things work in Vermont in that respect, they will often be scratching their heads and with some, uh, you know, finding it hard to believe that you could have a, a state like Vermont with uh, 246 towns where the town government has so much um, authority. And at the same time, if you hear from the, um, the League of Cities and Towns, they'll say, yeah, well, that's, we sort of have authority, but we don't have any you know, independent authority. Uh, we, we are, we're, we're relying on the legislature to give us the parcel out authority. And that's why I think the league is interested in, in, a, in a bill like this that would make it clear that there is local jurisdiction for nuisances. Jessica, you have a follow-up? I just want to say that because I have two sons that live in Colorado, I would be, I'm in total agreement with what you're saying, Tom, because the the rules around municipalities there for especially for rental units is unbelievable and very um, I don't know if I should use the word onerous I mean they really do come down on exactly what they expect of rental units and they in my history are st really struggling with this issue of how to deal with uh, odors and other issues around marijuana use in those environments and something that I haven't really shared with the committee but is really important I think to consider now that we're considering a bill like this is that my son um, who has had real issues with THC um, consumption was uh, we had to bring him home because he was had used so much um, that he started having panic attacks due to the THC because it was being stored in his fatty tissues. So after spending much time, and I won't go through the whole story, but much time with help here in an outpatient setting, he um, returned to school, and this was in the dorms. So I have two, two examples, which I think really pertain. In the dorms, we had to move him out because the um, amount, intensity of marijuana use inside the dorms where it was prohibited, he was still gathering the THC into his um, fatty tissues. And um, however, saliva testing, which they, we did because we wanted to be sure that he wasn't lying to us, um, came back negative. So um, 
he wasn't using, but he was ingesting the smoke. And the, um, then we moved him into his own apartment a, um, on a fourth floor, um, so we'd have no one above him. And um, same sort of thing, we, it was uh, all by himself, no one else. Um, and it went along fine. He was there for a full year. And the last summer, everything was great. Um, a big group moved in downstairs and again, the amount of um, marijuana smoking was so bad that he started to have panic attacks again. So we had to move him again. So the, my point only being that this can, it, it only impacts a very small percentage of users that have this issue, but it is an issue and it is important, I think, that we address it. But thank you. Okay. Uh, John Gannon. So, I mean, I, Jessica, I understand your concerns, but I mean, landlords today can prohibit smoking in apartments. I mean, I, I have mm -hmm. apartments, and I mean... And they have prohibited it. Yeah, I prohibit, I prohibit well, drug use, actually, yeah. at this point, illegal drug use. Um, and I actually, like Rob, have a tenant who uses medical marijuana, but as with, in Rob's case, it's tinctures and, and edibles. So, I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I think landlords do have under current law ways to prevent the situation you just described. Tom? But one, one, one comment on that is that in title, I forget which, I forget whether it's in Title 18, but if you sort of scroll through the table of contents, you can see where the General Assembly has chosen in other contexts to provide considerable more uh, structure for how uh, towns and cities can enact ordinances uh, in, a, as in another context. And I think uh, la um, landfills is, a, is one. Um, I don't have this open in front of me, but um, that, that's one. I mean, one. There's sort of two approaches to this. One is H819, which says towns, just to be, to, to, to be clear, towns continue to have this nuisance authority. And the other would be for the legislature to say, we want to put some, put some structure around that so that the authority of a town in that regard is not either not unlimited or is, is, is uh, focused or structured in a certain way. I'm not personally aware of any uh, towns that have already uh, gone in this direction to enact uh, nuisance regulations about consumption of cannabis on premises and uh, where, where that can, um, you know, the the odor and it can can uh, move into adjoining properties and causing either health problems that uh, Representative Brunstead is, is, is related or just simply um, un unpleasantness to have that kind of odor uh, be a bother. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tom. Committee, anything else for Tom? Okay, Tom, we're going to let you go back okay. to hopefully just lying down and continuing to heal, okay? Appreciate it. Good luck with the legislation. Thank you so much okay. for your time, Tom. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. He's recovering from surgery, oh, which was why he couldn't bad. come, mm -hmm. his doctor said. No. <laughs> um, okay. So, folks, uh, a thing to be thinking about also as we continue taking testimony what prompted, prompts me to say this is seeing the words that were in that report can, to consider whether or not we want to say marijuana if we move forward with this to say marijuana consumption and uh, cultivation the two pieces such as within the commission's recommendation um, might be good uh, Angela. Angela Angela's here yes no Yes, would you join us? Absolutely. And, and you're here from the Vermont Apartment Owners Association, yes? Yes. Okay. 
and for the record, please yep. stand. Absolutely. Good morning. My name is Angela Zykowski. I am a practicing attorney, and I'm the director of the Vermont Department Owners Association. We are a statewide trade association for residential landlords, um, and so I'm here representing the interests of those folks uh, for the committee today. So I think I've heard a lot of testimony here about trying to compare this particular ordinance or change to a noise ordinance. I don't know that that's maybe the proper analogy. I think throughout this entire conversation, if we were to substitute cigarette smoke for marijuana smoke, we may be having a different conversation, right? This, that's a very similar issue. Landlords face it currently. Tenant smoking, one tenant complaining about another tenant smoking. Landlords have the right to prohibit that in the lease like they will marijuana use and cultivation in their units. And we heard from the police chief, Whipple, or, that he gets zero calls about cigarette smoke because it's something that's dealt with between the two parties that are contracting with each other, the landlord and the tenant. So I'm not sure that this public nuisance language about regulating odor is necessary at this time. There are currently tools in place for the two parties who would be dealing with this, the landlord and tenant, to, to deal with. The landlord can prohibit it on their property. Tenants who have that prohibition, if they're being impacted by marijuana smoke, just like they can now if they're being impacted by cigarette smoke, can make a complaint to the landlord, and it's the landlord's obligation to start addressing that and dealing with it. And because this committee may not deal with a lot of housing issues, the process the landlord has for dealing with that currently is if they have credible evidence that say a tenant is violating a no smoking policy, they first have to send a 30 day termination notice to that party. And if the behavior doesn't stop or the tenant doesn't move who's in violation, the landlord has to then start a court action, which can take anywhere from two months to nine or 10 months to get through the process Meanwhile, the landlord has to prove that that particular tenant is smoking in violation of this policy in the lease. So it's a pretty heavy burden on the landlord for having to deal with that. One of my concerns is that if we have municipalities putting odor ordinances in place, that instead of them dealing with the offender, who is the tenant, that they are going to then point their finger at the landlord and say, well, we've done our part, we've talked to them. Now, landlord, it's your job to deal with this. And if you don't or you don't do it quick enough, we are going to start fining you or we are going to start taking action against you, the landlord, for somebody else's behavior. Question on that last piece, Cindy? Absolutely. Hi. You're talking about landlords and tenants, but people that have private property in a confined area or city, yep. that, that, that I think is more, or at least partially, what this would address. I think I would go back to, and generally my expertise is in the landlord-tenant relationship, is we already have sort of an analogous situation with cigarette smoking. We hear people aren't smoking in their houses anymore. They're going outside. So you have those confined space living arrangements already where people are smoking cigarettes outside. And I think we have a pretty well-documented body of work that shows how damaging secondhand smoke is to inhale or to be around. And yet we're not grappling with that type of complaint. Uh, we've got Jim and then Rob. I am the last person to be an expert on marijuana, but I think <laughs> arguably um, it's a stronger odor than cigarette smoke. 
That's not my area of expertise either. <laughs> not neither. I just remember back to my college days. Oh, so you're just making a statement? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, Rob? Well, a couple things. In, in my youth, I maybe I did inhale once or twice, <laughs> unlike a former I didn't say I inhaled. I didn't. <laughs> but, you know, I, I continued the walk of the mile in the shoes that she's talking about. And a lot of the tenants' behavior seemed to wind up in my lap, even though that they really shouldn't. I guess I'm going to ask a broader question here is on, on this particular piece of legislation that we're looking at, uh, are, are we looking to tailor this? I mean, either, either we're giving the municipalities the, the authority to go through and act ordinances, or I guess, uh, what are we trying to get at here with all this? Are we, are we trying to be more prescriptive in what we're sending down or over? It's kind of a general question. Anybody who wants to answer it? If you like it, Tom, let us I'll answer. I mean, Cindy? what I just said to her was if John is partying at his house next door to me mm -hmm. with all of his friends smoking marijuana and I'm sitting there with my grandchild who's three months old mm -hmm. and I don't want to have a cloud coming in my direction, I think that's what this mm -hmm. is about. Uh, apartments look like maybe they're covered, but as an individual, what am I supposed to do when he's infringing upon my air, just like my noise? Oh, sure, I, I, I get yeah. that. So I'm just throwing it out. I'm not. What I'm reading here is either, that right? are, are we going to give, the, uh, allow the adoption of civil ordinances to address the marijuana issue? <clears throat> And to me, that's kind of a yes or no thing. Rhetorical. Yeah. All, all, it, yeah. all it is is enabling legislation. So if a select board gets a lot of complaints all of a sudden mm -hmm. and they want to address it, mm -hmm. they, they, can, they can try. Right. Right now, it sounds like maybe they can't try if they get a lot of complaints or it's not clear. Mm -hmm. Doesn't the 511 or that, that law prohibit this from happening? That's why we have to enable it? Okay, well that was my understanding. If you read what um, uh, both the commission's report from um, the marijuana, I you know that Tom Little's co-chair of, in Tom Little's memo, he really does talk about how municipalities need, he believes, some authority to regulate mm -hmm. or prohibit odor and nuisances caused by cannabis use and cultivation. And then also looking at how can communities, what are they going to do with that ability? John? Well, I mean, getting back to Angela's testimony, I, I do agree with her that it puts the landlord on the hook um, when they have a tenant um, who, who is smoking marijuana. And I, I mean, that's, that's who the, you know, if there is a public ordinance, that's probably who they're going to talk to. Um, because that's probably the most responsible party um, at that location, whether you know they're you know a resident landlord or or they just own the apartment building. That's probably the person that has the most to lose. Um, or the most in the skin in the game, for sure. Right, or the most skin in the game. And, and I am concerned about you know putting a further burden um, on business owners who are trying trying to you know do their business. I mean, if they've tried to write into their leases that you can't smoke, whether it's cigarette smoke. Or marijuana smoke. I mean, they're trying to do the right thing, and, I, and I, I know our police chief in our town has talked to landlords about trying to curb drug use and other things through through le leases. Um, so I mean, I just worry about how far this is going to go. And, and I mean, if this was why this hasn't happened with cigarette smoke and other odors, and you know, is this as you know? I, I also see it as a potential slippery slope for a lot of odor nuisances. So I, I just worry where this is going to end. And if we could just keep focused with regard to Angela's testimony, then I we'll have focused. a larger conversation among ourselves. One of the things that causes me concern is how do you define a significant odor? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the ad maybe advantages with noise ordinances is that most of them have written into them decibel levels, and there are decibel meters that can be used to determine if the noise is too loud um, or 
during certain times of the night, if it can be heard from the street, then it's deemed too loud. So there's some very easily identifiable ways to determine if a noise ordinance is being violated, whereas a odor ordinance, I mean, everybody's nose is a little bit different, and some people might be more uh, susceptible or may be more sensitive. I mean, I uh, taking a representative weeds example, if that was not a marijuana smoking outside but with cigarette smoking and I was the neighbor, that would actually have a really big impact on me because mm -hmm. I'm very sensitive to cigarette smoke. Um, but it's just something that we I've learned to live with because I personally don't feel like I have the right to tell them what they can and can't be doing on their property. Um, but that's my personal viewpoint. But I think it becomes very difficult to try to regulate this type of scenario and I just and concerned about what municipalities may do with this and the impact it would have on my landlord constituents. Does anybody on the committee have further questions for Angela? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lynn, VLCT. Hello, everyone. I'm Zach Al from the Williams Citizen Towns. Um, in the interest of time, I won't repeat um, prior um, testimony and just sort of comment on the uh, proposal as is and some of our concerns and what we like. Um, we support the idea behind this uh, legislation, uh, proposed legislation, giving the uh, option, the enabling authority to have communities decide whether or not they want to um, have some standards in place to deal with odors from marijuana consumption. Um, and the only real concerns here have already actually been mentioned um, with the language, including the, the word significant odor. Um, not being able to define that. It's, I think our preference would be either to define significant or get rid of the word significant entirely. Um, and as Tom Little had mentioned earlier, um, more of a question um, as to why the odor um, would be limited to consumption rather than consumption and cultivation, because those are two issues that are already um, very big issues for municipalities and other states that have legalized. Um, so we support this. Um, again, it's just enabling authority. Uh, it still has to go through the whole process of the ordinance adoption. And I can guarantee that in a place like Burlington that might want to go do something like that. Um, they're going to have significant um, public hearing um, hearings and hear a lot of <coughs> feedback from individuals. And um, there'll be quite a vetting process to determine what works and what doesn't work for that particular community. So I've, I'm open to any questions. I have um, reached out to many states over the last three years since this marijuana issue has been on the table and talked to many municipalities and um, I know more than I thought I'd ever know <laughs> about um, marijuana and um, I just would like to reiterate that of all of the states that have legalized marijuana they are all home rule states, um, either pure home rule states or limited home rule states, and we are the only state that has legalized marijuana, and it's a Dillon's rule state. So really paying attention to that authority that's given to municipalities is really important, because right now the only thing that um, gives any authority to a municipality right now is prohibiting um, the consumption in a um, public place, um, but even then it's only after adoption of a civil ordinance to do so. So um, I guess a good way of looking at this is to say if we didn't pass this, what would municipalities do when they get complaints about these sorts of issues and um, sort of have that sort of play out? But I'd be 
happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, you mentioned Burlington. Um, and I won't begin to understand what's in Burlington's city charter, but they seem to have um, more authority than perhaps other municipalities uh, because of their charter. Do we know if they could regulate it today based on their charter? I would think that even if they did have something prior to 511, it would be trumped by the legislation that was passed. So I would assume that the answer is no. Okay. Other questions? Yes, Ralph. So based on your comments, Gwen, that I'm, I'm okay. gathering that you feel that something has to pass and it may need to be even a bit broader than what this language covers. The feedback that I have gotten from other communities in other states um, is that this is a significant issue and um, the complaints that they get are not falling on the state, they're falling either on the county or local governments. Um, so, granted, the, um, let's just say this had, um, cultivation also included in the language. It may not be as big of an issue, um, now because of the limited amount of marijuana that's currently allowed, but if down the line in Vermont decides to expand it and allow a lot more home grows or widespread home grows or even commercial or industrial grows like you see out west, it will be absolutely necessary um, because it has been such an issue out there. And you'll see an entire department, like in Denver, for example, you'll see an entire municipal department spending millions of dollars just dealing with odor issues. And it's not an inexpensive regulatory process. Well, it's not much of a stretch to think that Currently, cultivation is illegal. When it becomes legal, that it's going to become more of an issue um, from that regard, isn't it? Potentially. I would assume that there might be some increase in cultivation once people are allowed to cultivate. Thank you. I can't say for sure, but I'm assuming. Other questions for Gwen? Yeah. So, Gwen, um, I'm not sure where, you know, we all are on this particular bill, but as I see it, we have two choices. We can advance it like it is with some slight amendment or wait and see if your select boards get a lot of complaints between July and December and try to tackle it in January. And I just didn't know if you had any um, insider preferences as to what direction you'd like to see well, us go now. VLCT has been advocating for this enabling authority since this discussions, these you discussions have. began for years. Um, the the calls are going to come regardless of whether there's going to be, um, you know, whether this passes or it doesn't pass. It will be frustration that they don't have the authority, um, or just that going through the process of adopting ordinance in general is is tough and they're always having to adopt their I's and cross their T's and make sure everything I mean these are very time consuming processes and especially for these sorts of issues that are very emotional and people have very strong opinions on um, that's just a guarantee so I guess in terms of workload maybe it would be a better idea to just not do anything because then a municipality can say call your representative because they didn't give us any of the enabling authority um, but for those towns that really want to <laughs> grapple with it, you know, that's their choice. I just, I see this as being proactive. I think, I don't see a downside to it. I think we need to do something ahead of time before, before it goes any further. I, I support it. Anybody else? Rob? Well, I, I totally support it, and I absolutely agree with you, but I think we need to expand it in that it's got to be not just about the consumption but the cultivation. Um, and there's a small part of me that, that it can't be just about the odor, potentially, in that 
Again, I'm looking at it from a landlord's perspective, but I got a tenant that's all of a sudden decided to do some home growing and I don't know about it. Um, is there a safety component to it where now we've got grow lights and higher electrical use mm -hmm. and you know, now all of a sudden I got something going on in an apartment that, you know, I'm not in there, you know, but maybe once every couple months. Um, I'm There's just it, not sure that odor should be the only deterrent. Well, that's a whole, I can talk for hours about that. I might actually send a PowerPoint presentation that I gave about this whole municipal issue with this marijuana legalization that goes through all of these things. It's all of the multitude of issues that you're dealing with. Again, like when you're talking about comparing other states that are legalized and states like Vermont where we don't have building codes by and large, you can count on one hand how many municipalities have building codes, and we don't really have any zoning or like code enforcement um, like other states have for single family dwellings. Um, it's a big issue um, when you're talking about grows and lights because it's already an issue in other states that have permitting processes in place um, for commercial grows and even residential just because they already have these codes in place um, for you know electric and plumbing. So um, once you start peeling away the onion, you realize Vermont's really very different from how other states are, are running. I just wondered if we needed a little language around that, the medical marijuana issue and stuff. I don't want to make it onerous or odorous or odorous or whatever. <laughs> um, well, anyway. I understand where John's coming from, but I'm going to tell you what, that regardless if I had a tenant that has a medical marijuana card, if they're smoking it in the building and it's causing my other tenants some issues, that I still have to address it as a landlord. So that's where, you know, yeah, we can try to work it out like I have, but all this winds up on the landlord's lap. Every bit of it winds up on our laps. And quite honestly, it's a real would pain. It, would it be helpful? I wonder if the, if the medical marijuana user was on the ground floor apartment instead of the third floor apartment. Um, you can't the smoke risers. Uh, you can't dictate where they go necessarily. Well, I just try to work with them. I don't know. Yeah. And, and we're getting. Getting into the weeds. Williams, Williams uh, not indicating a desire to weigh in on these pieces. On which one? <laughs> the, the, the medical? No, we don't. I mean, that I, that's separate in our opinion. I will answer, actually, since you're back here representing Deborah, that you had a question about the public health officer yeah, yeah. and the impact in this. Um, so, just by definition, public health officer is really um, only charged with dealing with sort of severe sort of health code issues um, where we're talking about public health hazards and public health risks so really it's a much higher standard in terms of the rules that are in place from the department of health so this wouldn't be a, 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 an issue of a town health officer unless for example if you pass this legislation and um and it also goes back to the question that you had with um tom little which is the whole um giving resources for people other than law enforcement to enact or to um, to be the ticketing officer for um, violations. Like, for example, I'm a former zoning administrator for in the town of Richmond. And so in um, I was given the authority through the Judicial Bureau to have ticketing authority to issue a ticket. I'm not a law enforcement officer. Um, but you can delegate, a select word obviously, can delegate someone to have ticketing authority over a certain issue. So maybe a town would delegate that authority, but it wouldn't be an authority that's you know, vested in them in terms of their job description as a health officer. So but it like, could be a significant risk, especially secondhand smoke for Well, children. given 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 the standards that I've seen from the Department of Health, I don't know how that would, I, I just don't see how it would rise to that level. You have to really, it has to be a pretty severe um, instance of a public health risk. And um, odors from even smoking um, don't rise to that level. So. So could you send us that white paper? I think it would be helpful. It was a PowerPoint presentation. Are you talking about okay. PowerPoint? Yeah, yeah. I think I'll send it. Yeah, I'll send it. That would be great. Yeah. Okay, so committee, any other questions for our floor? Is there anybody else in the room that wanted to be heard from on this issue, on this bill? When, if you don't mind going back to where you, you were seated before. Sure. And we'll have 
Go back to where you came from. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Virginia Renfrew. <clears throat> I represent the medical marijuana dispensaries, and I also represent the HIV community. And I wasn't planning on testifying today, but just sitting in here and um, listening, I thought that uh, I would just raise some concerns that uh, I have around this. And I think that it would be a concern. I, you know, the significant odor, how you define that, I understand that, but I think removing significant and just having any odor would really, in, in not thinking about, let's remove like the apartments in, you know, the multiple homes. Let's talk about someone on their private property. And I think as you heard from one of the police chiefs that they really haven't received any calls around uh, medical marijuana patients who have since, 19, uh, since 2004 been able to have grow two plants. So uh, that has not been, but they have to grow it inside in a locked room. So uh, the odor would be just inside of their house, not outside. But I, I just think that when you think about somebody, the legislature has passed legalization of marijuana. And so now you're saying, if you're sitting on your porch, your privately owned home, <clears throat> and your neighbor is down this, you know, not that far away, that you could actually um, be cited for that. And I think, again, you go back to how if your, your neighbor smokes cigarettes, I'm sure that that is, can be disturbing to you. Um, and, but I just, I definitely have some concerns around, uh, you know, how this, how this is gonna play out, and if this is at this point even needed. It, is it, in fact, better, I think, as, uh, as you had said, Representative Harrison, that, um, that to wait and see, because um, I'm not sure if you're really looking for a problem that doesn't exist. I also have some concerns around dispensaries, because dispensaries do cultivate, um, and um, we haven't had complaints about uh, odor, um, but I mean, obviously, if you drive up to a dispensary outside, you even though they're growing inside, you can smell uh, the uh, cannabis being grown. Um, they're not, you know, in residential areas, um, and but. One of them is in a business complex, um, and again, there's been no complaints, but then again, there could be. So I just wanted you to kind of weigh that uh, as you're thinking about moving forward with this bill. Any questions for Virginia? More, more, more comment. Um, I think it's very important to leave the word significant in there, even though it it's a burden to de describe it, but but without it, the least trivial. Somebody is walking down the sidewalk and they smell something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have to have we have to have some threshold. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just some comments. Uh, so many things you can that are manufactured or being grown, you can smell before you get to them. Uh, if you're around a coffee roaster, you can smell the coffee. If you're going going to a distillery, you can smell it from the outside. So um, I guess I would want to know if there are studies that determine whether or not the aroma has an effect. Now, um, it was the smoke, not the so um, is there a connection between aroma and actually having an effect on someone who's breathing that in? Uh, obviously, secondhand smoke can be, um, you know, can be harmful, even just for the smoke part. I don't know if it actually gets the person high, too, but obviously it can be absorbed. I'd like to see some, some more studies on, on these effects. I think around that, uh, Marsha, they've, they've done some stuff, and I don't know where to find it at this point, around living close to a pig farm or large chicken 
uh, egg producing operations, uh, and it certainly is uh, pretty bad. Odiferous. And, and yes. people who who spread manure in the spring. I know. Dairy. I, I know some dairy, yep, dairy farms that they certainly, uh, you know, the, the neighbors don't like it there for a, a few weeks or something, and it works its way in and kind of dissipates a little bit. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's some thresholds for the Department of Health. I would think around the, those those things anyway. Mm -hmm. Any other conversation? Any other discussion? I'll just say that I, I think we might be jumping the gun on this one a little bit. There, there's no problem that anybody can identify, including, I mean, it's out there now. It's probably not going to change much. And even if the incidences of complaints double, it'll still be zero. I mean, the whole town of South Burlington is pretty, pretty tight. But, but there's problems <clears throat> in Colorado. But anyways, so Already. there's the, the, yeah, the significant part, I think, is maybe would need to be defined. And uh, the the tenant, or I can remember her name was, uh, hold on, Angela, Angela, was concerned about it falling onto apartment owners, which I think we need to think about that. So I'm just, uh, what problem are we trying to solve? I think if we have a problem, then we can <coughs> solve it when the time comes, but it just seems to me that there's a few outstanding issues that need to be, or questions that need to be answered first. Jessica and Carl, um, I just want to say that we're not, this bill is not making the ordinance happen. We're just giving, we're, I think the problem that we're dealing with is that we live in a Dillon's state, and all the other states that have legalized are in, um, what's the other one? <laughs> The other kind of home, 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 home. And so that makes the whole playing field a bit different. And so what we're doing is just trying to level that a little bit and give municipalities other uh, the opportunity to do this if they want to, but they still have to have public hearings. And so it's, it's a quite a process still. And they probably would wait too, till they, I would hope they would, until they have concerns. If they don't have concerns, they don't have to pass it. They're not gonna wanna jump into this. I would assume. Um, Rob? Um, as much as I normally do what you say <laughs> in many ways, um, I have to totally disagree on this one. Um, currently, it is illegal. It's going to be legal. We're going to have these issues are going to arise. And I think, like Patty had said, this is an opportunity to be somewhat proactive rather than putting municipalities and communities in a position of saying, well, there's not a whole lot we can do right now. I think we have an obligation to give them the tools along with what we've given them, and that's whether you call it a problem or not, but we have to give them the tools that they need to address these issues. And, I, you know, I'm going to climb on my soapbox here. As a landlord, I mean, it, it just everything winds up in my lap. Um, and this is just one more darn thing. And we've somehow got to work together to help <clears throat> work on this situation because it, it's going to, you said there's 80,000 now. It, it could maybe double. Who knows? Jim? You know, I was initially thinking that maybe it would be okay to wait till January and just see. But as I think about it, if we don't provide the enabling, especially now that the issue has been brought to light and put before it, this committee will bear the full brunt of responsibility if complaints come in July, August, September, and we have not, we have blocked, by doing nothing, we have blocked municipalities of having the right, the ability to do an ordinance, which they may not do, but we've taken that away, that we've taken that ability away from them by spending this morning on this issue with the bill before us. So that's just, that's a question for all of us. Do we want that responsibility? And I would add to that, that let's say hypothetically we move forward and give the, add this authority to the list of authorities which the state has given to communities should they want to take advantage of that authority. It takes, there's time that's necessary for a community to take to make an ordinance. It's not something they can do overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if we don't do, if we're not, I would suggest to use the term you use, Patty, somewhat proactive in this. 
um, if we waited to, to, to January, we put communities behind the eight ball, behind the eight ball doubly, because we wouldn't have given them the authority proactively, and then even if we did it in January, then they're, they're still behind the eight ball because of being behind in the time, in terms of the time it takes to put an ordinance in place if they want to do that. So based on the local news I saw, aren't we being given some credit for not allowing some local ordinance changes to go forward that some wanted to? I do believe so. But that's based, but, but that's based, if I could, that's based, this is a reference to the uh, proposals out of Burlington a couple of times through oh. ch proposed charter change. That, for that piece, there is a statute, a Vermont statute on the books which specifically and quite clearly prohibits local communities from creating their own right. ordinances right. around firearms. Correct. So it's, it's one, mm -hmm. well, it's good effort, but it's, mm -hmm. a, it's, a, it's an apple and an orange. Mm -hmm. if I, no, I don't think so. I think no, credit's being it. given. <laughs> Jim? And just, and, and finally, if we do decide to go forward, um, I would agree significant needs to be in there. I would support a carve out for medical marijuana and I, I would add caution to an interest to getting into the growing. I, I, I kind of like the more focused consumption um, for now. Um, I, I, a little different on that one. Okay, that's fine. Um, that's fine. I just think we got to be careful that we don't bite off more than we can chew. No pun intended. No, no pun intended. <laughs> I, yes. We can finalize this in breakfast.